Greetings and welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogilov from the University's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. As many of you know, we regularly use these events as a way to get acquainted with new academic and administrative leaders. And today I'm really pleased to welcome David Wilson, who began his tenure as Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy on July 1st. Prior to joining the Goldman School, Will Wilson was the Senior Associate Dean for the Social Sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Delaware, Delaware, and a full professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations with a joint appointment in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. That's an interesting blend of academic disciplines we'll be talking more about as we go along today. Mm -hmm. David's own widely published and cited research examines how individuals formulate their political preferences about race and justice, and how social cognition shapes broader survey response behaviors. He's the co-author of the forthcoming book, Racial Resentment in the Political Mind. David is also a military veteran with 19 years of service in the US Army Reserves, including combat tours for Operations Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. As always, we welcome any and all questions you may have for our guest today. Just post them to our Facebook live streaming site as we go along and we'll do our best to answer them. David, welcome to Campus Conversations. Thank you, Dan. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, you should know. Uh, so tell me something. I'm always interested. Um, why Berkeley? Why Goldman? What, what brought you here? What, what got you interested when either you got that recruiting call or saw a posting, wherever it was? Ex excellent way to start. Uh, grew up on the East Coast. Been there most of my life. California is this mysterious place. We had visited on various trips to the national parks, but we had never really engaged the idea of the state and its, its kind of history and its, its, its kind of California spirit that I, I read about in the strategic plan. And I was impressed by the legacy, the sense of pride that the university has in excellence, the, the public mission that is beyond just kind of being a public university, but actually trying to do good on behalf of the public and be accountable to the public as well. So I was impressed by how, how the public mission really emphasizes service and contribution to something bigger than yourself. And the University of Delaware is a private university and, and some other affiliations I've been with were private entities. And it kind of changed the way I thought about what I wanted to do in my academic career. And so I looked at Berkeley very seriously, and when I looked at the Goldman School, I saw an interdisciplinary faculty focused on excellence. Its reputation, just like the Berkeley, Berkeley reputation preceded it. So I knew it was excellent. I knew it had high standards. I knew it had really smart faculty and really mature and outstanding students. And I wanted to, to be more connected with uh, an area where we could have impact. And so the value of a professional public policy school is that we can really take our scholarly work apply it to things in a real way and talk about the real world implications and, and, and bring things closer to change, if you, if you know what I'm saying. I got that. Um, we're going to get into we're gonna, I, a lot more about Goldman and policy in your areas of research, but you mentioned we, this is also a chance to get to know you. So do you, do you come with family? What's your, what's your setup away from work? Yeah, here, here, here's my story. Uh, I got in a Subaru with my <laughs> wife and my cat and drove five days across the United States, the great, great United States. I, I mentioned there was a cat involved. And uh, we landed <laughs> in Berkeley uh, in early June. And um, we enjoyed the ride together and got really close. We're all still together. Everyone's still happy. But uh, we landed here in, uh, in July and I mean, in June, and we've, we've been located in Berkeley and, and we're really happy with the move. Do you have any school age kids? What's your children? Uh, I have a, I'm sorry. My son is, is 23 years old. He's, he's six foot five, uh, way smarter than I am. And he works at a startup in San Francisco. And my wife is also way smarter than I am. And she works for the university. Uh, and we met in graduate school at Michigan state university. And, and, uh, uh she's again, the, the brains behind our operation. Wait, so are you telling us, uh, we hired the wrong Wilson? Perhaps uh, <laughs> I should plead a fifth. I guess I don't know. No, you got you got two good you got two good uh, 
smart scholars who know uh, the academic world and, and know how to, uh, to understand excellence. Yeah, so I'm always curious, and I tend to ask this question a lot of you know folks who are new. So you've been at Berkeley since uh, July 1, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what surprised you, or and what, what have you been initial your initial impressions of the campus? We've got this big, huge reputation that has different shapes and forms depending on people's disciplines and geography and probably politics. So what's it been like? Yeah, it's it's. I don't want to say the word shock, but it's been a lot of surprises on a daily basis. And it's because when you're on the East Coast, if you've, you've ever made the migration, uh, you don't really pay attention much to California. And if mm. you're in California, you don't pay much attention to the East Coast. So you don't think about the day to day things that happen in California. You may think about the big things like an earthquake or natural disaster, but you don't think about the planning that you have to prepare for for the nat natural disaster or the politics of it or or how there's a culture of, you know, here's what we do or here's what we don't do. And uh, that climate, environment, the homelessness situation, the housing costs, the cost of everything, uh, the urbanness of the Berkeley hmm. area is almost, it's kind of European almost. It's, hmm. not, it's not urban like East Coast urban. And having Oakland right here and San Francisco be close, but be across the bay, it's just different. The weather is different. It rained last night. It rained yesterday <laughs> afternoon. And I was staring out the window. Like, oh, it's just so wonderful. And so that's the third time I think since I've been here that it's rained. So you're constantly experiencing new things on a regular basis. And you're engaging with really smart people who are thinking about the world um, differently. And I mean, from, from the person that's unsheltered that I meet at the, the coffee shop to the you know, the Nobel Prize winners who are on campus now, you're really getting exposed to a new world. And for people who are familiar with Berkeley and have been here for a long time, you, you kind of maybe take it for granted. But to us, us new folks, it's like a whole eye-opening experience about uh, what's possible and, uh, you know, the history and everything is just so rich. So. Hmm. And what's on your agenda for the school? I mean, you're, you're coming in after a dean who served had a long and distinguished uh, tenure. Um, schools in great shape, one of the believed and seen, perceived to be, and is one of the finest schools of its type in the entire country. Um, have you come to just make sure you keep on keeping on, or do you have sort of ambitious goals for evolution and change? Where, where are you headed? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I First, Henry Brady is an outstanding scholar and was an outstanding dean for the school. And he's been nothing but uh, kind of a stalwart in really helping us and helping the school to be successful and helping me to be successful as a new and incoming dean. Also, our staff is, is excellent and really play a role in helping me to understand the school and understand what our priorities are. And then our faculty and students have just been the most welcoming group of, of uh university uh, citizens that I've, I've ever encountered. And everyone I think is, is understanding that this is a period of transformation and an opportunity for change. And the things that I'm thinking about are not changes that are, are uh, big things, but thinking more about focusing in on how everything we do can be transformational. We're a number one school of public policy analysis and we've been there for, for a while. We have an outstanding reputation that gives us a little bit of leeway to experiment and try some new things. And so we are, we are enhancing and we are expanding and elevating our horizons more so than changing them, so to speak. So uh, we'll be experimenting with how we do our scholarship, how we organize ourselves, how we create an infrastructure that allows us to be really outstanding. We'll be innovating with our degree programs, making sure that we are trying new things out in, in the classroom and outside of the classroom to enhance learning so that the experience is transformational, not just in terms of academics, but also in terms of culture. We'll be investing in student life, making sure that students, when they leave here, they have a source of pride to go along with the degree that they've earned. And we're also, of course, as, as many people know, we're thinking about uh, our rocket ship, our building and our space where we can actually uh, take all of these new technologies around learning and scholarship and uh, student life investments and go somewhere that really does expand how we think about public policy and how we solve uh, public, public problems. So we are, we're, we're laser focused on the future and being a school of public policy 
that realizes what the Goldman difference is, that really articulates the values of innovation, diversity, our public mission, being transparent, uh, being transformational, and, and again, embracing that California spirit that uh, nothing is too big of a problem for us to solve. I'm going to circle back to you for a second and ask if you can give us just maybe an example or two of some of the things you're thinking about a little more specific. Before that, just want to remind folks who may be who may have joined us late, we're talking today with the new dean of the Goldman School, David Wilson. Um, as always, we welcome your questions. And if you do have questions for David as we go along, just post them to our Facebook live streaming site and we'll do our best to get to them. So let's go back and let me pick up where you were on the broad level. Um, Sounds really exciting. Can you give us a, without letting too many cats out of the bag, um, some of the things you're thinking about that would count as new, either in a evolutionary or a transitional sense? Yeah, yeah. So I, as a cat person, I, I'll let a few cats out of the bag. <laughs> um, one thing we've been thinking about is we have nine or 10 research centers. And of course, we have uh, a lot of ideas that come to the Goldman School. And one way that we can better work together and collaborate across research centers is to organize ourselves in terms of an institute, an Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, one that has a leadership and support structure that allows faculty to be, faculty to be experts at their fields and at the, at the research work, but has a, has a support staff necessary to help do all of the Kind of grunt work, so to speak, organizing of HR, helping with pre-award and post-award, dealing with facilities and equipment and spacing needs, faculty who get kind of, that have to deal with all of the, the details within the proposal can sometimes detract and create a disincentive for going after more uh, sponsored activities. So organizing ourselves in a way that allows uh, excellence and, and outstanding research to be conducted in the school, but also transformed into uh, practical solutions to the big problems requires a new kind of structure. A second thing we're thinking about is how to expand our footprint in, in different areas. Right now, Goldman is primarily located in Berkeley. We should be thinking about how to have impact in Sacramento. We should be thinking about how to have impact in DC. We should be thinking about utilizing our international partners so that we can take, again, the Goldman difference in the Berkeley brand and work on behalf of the public sector and on behalf of public solutions in other locations. We have the expertise, we have the alumni, we have the tradition, we could, uh, we could do a little bit more out there to have, uh, have a bigger impact. You know, it was interesting, you were, talking, you were talking before about Goldman and how important its mission that includes public policy analysis is and I'm looking back on the notes I took when you and I sort of had a preparatory chat before this event and you said you're not a public policy analyst. Um, help us through that. In other yeah. words, if you're not that, what are you and how does that work in terms of your fit as a dean of a school of public policy? Yeah, good, uh, good, good question. So I am a person that the, the public policy is is a vocation more so than a scholarly and scientific discipline. Policy analysis is a method for understanding the effectiveness and efficiency of policy. My, my work in public policy is looking at how the public experiences public policy. Mm. So when I do public policy analysis, I'm looking at, all right, is the, if the policy is effective, why don't people like it? If the policy is not effective, why do people support it? Um, if, if we're talking about a $3.5 trillion uh, piece of legislation, why are we thinking more about the cost than the benefits? So as a, as a policy scholar, my work centers on how the public understands public policy. And so that public voice speaks back to the policy process and helps to define what the problems actually are, what are acceptable or feasible solutions, what are the best mechanisms for implementing public policy and the like. So I'm more on the, the behavioral side or the policy feedback and in many ways implementation side. There are many uh, traditions in the public policy world. There's public management, there's organization theory, there's public admission, uh, I'm sorry, public administration, there's public affairs and public policy and policy analysis. And so there are a lot of different methods and my, my work isn't traditionally in that, that scope of public policy. 
but I do look at um, the impacts of policy and I do try to understand its value. As a dean, where that comes in is it helps me to be a constant student of what our faculty are doing and what our students are interested in. As a uh, senior associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, we had 26 departments. And when I would have to speak to each of those departments, it required them to explain to me what was important about their discipline, what was consequential about the research they were doing, and how to best support them. And, and as a dean, you, you want to kind of have an open lens. You don't, you don't always want to come with kind of a, a set mindset on, on how discipline should proceed. And that helps you innovate a little bit more. So my eyes are, 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 and ears are both wide open as being a dean of public policy. I do have a, a master's of public administration, so I know the discipline. I've experienced this in the classroom and a little bit in work. But um, what I really want to do is find the best ways to ensure our faculty and our school are thinking about uh, policy in a way that's moving as fast as the world is moving. In many ways, higher education tends to kind of follow or lag what's happening in the real world. And we have an opportunity right now to kind of catch up and prepare for the future. Boy, I, I, we, we only have an hour. Every, every answer of yours like uh, makes me think of about 7,000 more questions. And as did this last one, both personal and professional, I, I'm curious about your background. In other words, was something about the way you came up or your family, is there a connection there to what your academic interests and pursuits are all about? Yeah, I, I, I tell this story quite a bit. So my, I grew up in a split home. My mother and father divorced at an early age. My father was an a, a immigrant from Panama, family located in Roxbury, Dorchester, Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> and my mother's family was from Nashville, where we tend to draw out our R's and, and talk a little bit longer, use y'all quite a bit. And so no matter where we would spend our time, my sister and I, if I was in the Northeast, I talked plenty because I still had that Hmm. That Southern draw. When I was in the South, I, I, I tend to talk a little fast sometimes and get all twitchy when I talk. That was my Northeast side. And people would, would pick on us a little bit. People would, would say we're different and we're odd. And, and really early in my life, I started thinking about how you treat people, how people treat one another, maltreatment, good, bad, et cetera. And that colored my, my research and my interest throughout uh, undergrad, graduate school, uh, professional work, and then uh, academia. And so my work centers on justice. It centers on how we think about people getting what they, they deserve or not. Hmm. And that includes a handshake or a, a greeting or holding back certain benefits uh, that connect with a policy or not allowing people to be members of certain communities. How we treat one another really determines how we think about what government does and, and the direction in which our country is going. So, uh, so I've, I've, I've kind of got this lineage of justice and behavior, and uh, my main tool of understanding the world is survey research. So I worked at the Gallup polling organization and, and helped uh, the, the country and, and public agencies understand what the public is thinking about the direction of the country and the policies that are being implemented on a daily basis. So, so my background is, is broad. Uh, you mentioned the military before, and, and that has a little bit of the how we treat one another thing as well. But that shaped, er, those early years shaped my research and my interest. So, I, I mean, I have to ask, I'm curious. Um, it's not, you. It, it's, I don't want to say usual, um, but it stands out that you spent 19 years in the military and at the same time have this incredible, have had this incredible academic career. I mean, the list of your publications is page for those who haven't seen it page after page after page and incredible accomplishments landed here as a dean. How do you sort of connect those two parts of your life? What, what led you to military service and how did it influence your subsequent choices? Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, I joined the military uh, when I was uh, my fall of my senior year in high school. Wow. I, I was an athlete and I got an injury and I panicked. And there were these commercials on TV that said, if you join the army, they'll pay for your college. And that was the, the first time, you know, I, I kind of fell into something I should have been paying more attention to. Than, I didn't read this, the fine print on a lot of that stuff at the time. But, but I joined and they, they said, hey, just, you know, go one weekend a month and, and everything will be fine. And you'll, you'll do great things. and You'll travel the world. Um, that's not how it works, but that's what I did. And uh Three years later, when I was a sophomore, 
I think a sophomore in college, Desert Storm kicks off. And all of a sudden, my world is transformed because I'm being mobilized to go to war. And I'm like, oh, my, I'd only seen movies about this thing. Even though you, you go through basic training, you get trained. It's not real until you have to really you know, do it. For, for most people in the military, it, it doesn't become real until you're activated. So that shaped one experience. And then later on, I just I never got out of the military. I enjoyed the, the process of understanding how the military worked, building the camaraderie around uh, uh, fellow soldiers and in the training and the learning, all the, the traveling, all the things I got to do eventually. And then in 2001, 9-11 happens and I'm deployed again. And that really transformed my life. So Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom, I spent 15 months away from my family and, and really had to reflect on, and, and of course, a lot of time in the combat, combat zone, understanding with a different lens about how we treat one another mm. and, and how we regulate that treatment in mm. our own minds and through policy. And when I came back, I'd, I'd had a little bit about enough of Washington, D.C. and wanted to get out. And I had been publishing and doing work at Gallup and, uh, and went, had, got the great fortune to go into academia, landed at the University of Delaware. A few years later, got an opportunity to do administrative work. And so here I am. Wow. What an Long interesting story. story. What a great journey. Um, you know, you mentioned when you wanted to get out of D.C. and I was listening to you before and um, talk about really a set of inspiring goals and belief in the importance of the mission of the school. But then I'm trying to reconcile this, you know, a lot of what the work that your students are doing and, and the careers that they're going to go on to have are going to find expression in legislation and government action. And at the moment, speaking of Washington, government seems entirely broken. Uh, in terms of being able to put points on the board, being able to progress with legislation that's important to one party, you know, a, a complete freeze. So how, how do you keep students sort of with their chin up and, and feeling that there actually it is possible to implement and affect change and reform and make the world a better place through public policy? Because it seems at times so futile when you look at the news coming out of the Capitol. Yeah. You know, this is, so I, I developed these kind of, I don't know if they're proverbs, but uh, when I was in the military and some of the toughest times where it didn't seem like anything was changing in the world, I, I said, um, one, everything happens for a reason. You hmm. can't always control what that is. Two, it's all relative. It could always be worse. Uh, three, if you, if you somewhat set your expectations low, you'll likely always make a profit. And then four, always have a backup plan. If A doesn't work, make sure you got B ready to go. And, and how I talk to students about politics and government is that serving the public is one of the hardest things that one could do. And if you're looking for a challenge, public service is it. No one will, well, I shouldn't say no one, I'll speak in absolutes, but you'll get very little appreciation. You won't make a ton of money but you'll be able to impact people in a way that you can actually see. And, and so when, when we think about public policy, which is, which is how government solves public problems, but government doesn't often do it alone. It does it with the nonprofit sector. It does it with the private sector. It does it with other international actors. It does it with you know, volunteerism and all kinds of other things. But and it, and it has all kinds of mechanisms from uh, you know, tax and spend to educating the public to actually doing research. The reason why universities exist is in part is because the government knows we need really smart people to help them understand what's going on in the world. The science, the social science, the humanities, the arts, the, all, all the, tra the traditions included. So um, it seems like government is not working, but government is working. It's our democracy. We, the people comprise the government what we have to do is constantly remind ourselves that there is a process for change. And if we become experts in that process, we can actually realize change. If we, if we move forward thinking that we can disrupt the process in many ways, it sometimes puts more barriers in the middle uh, of, of change, but um, it is possible. We, we don't see as much of it because the story is more salacious if it's negative. Uh, you know, if if a plane crashes, the story is 50 people died, not 50 people survived because we're we have this is where political psychology comes in. We have a negativity bias. It tends to it tends to capture our attention more than the status quo does. So uh, so we're constantly reminding students that change is possible, that our commitment is to community and the public service. 
and that we should be thinking about everything we do with the spirit of shared success, that we rise and fall together, and that our democracy is only as meaningful as our commitment to it. So, uh, so that's how we, we, we keep our students and our faculty and, and hopefully the public engaged. So I wanna to talk to you about, we're gonna circle around to it, just about what's happening in the country in terms of polarization and sort of these, the aid, the era of the conflicting narratives and all the rest. But um, on the first step down that path, talk to us a little bit about this blend of your academic interests that you also had a joint appointment in, at your last school to the Department of Psychological Psychology and Brain Sciences. What, how are all of these things connected? What does brain science bring to public policy and, and politics and, and all of your interests? How are they all connected? First thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, higher education and departments come up with these names and sometimes <laughs> they don't reflect what they really do. So I was in a department of political science and international relations. I didn't do any international relations. And I was in the department of psychological and brain sciences. I didn't do any brain sciences. I did psychological sciences. So I was a political psychologist. I still am a political psychologist. And what the political psychologists do is they study behavior. They use psychological uh, theories and methods to understand how people process political information and make judgments about what that information means. And then as a result of that processing, behave, whether it's a vote, whether it's uh, uh, wear a button or a sticker, whether it's share information, uh, whether it's yell at someone who's walking down the street or whether it's uh, painting something on a building over on the other side of campus. Um, we are motivated by certain things. And the job of the political psychologist is to understand those motivations, including supporting policies or practices, many of which exist here at the University of California, Berkeley. Our hmm. shared governance approach is all about this idea of democratic input and why that's valuable. It creates something in the minds of those who are acting in the, in the, in the sphere. And so hopefully it creates trust. It creates some level of of commitment, it creates some sense of community, but to people who are on the outside, it may be intolerant, it may be seen as something that is uh, 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 not welcoming or overly rigorous. And so the political psychologist helps people to understand how the mind is connecting to what's actually happening in society. And in politics to the political psychologist, it's not just government. It's literally, if there are 12 people in a room, how do they decide what movie they're going to go watch? Is it the strongest person that gets to pick? Do they vote on it? Is it a majority? Is it super majority? Is it secret ballot? Is it public ballot? You know, rock, paper, scissors. What is it? And the, the political scientist looks at the rules and organizations. The psychological side looks at how people accept or don't accept what's been decided. And the political psychologist will always have a job. Fascinating. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to get to them in just a second. Just remind anybody who may have joined us late that we are, as always, taking questions from the audience today. If you do have questions for David Wilson, the new dean of the Golden School of Public Policy, just post them to our Facebook live streaming site and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them. One more question before I go to those that just came in. I, I think we're all experiencing, no matter what our politics are, this difficulty of how to engage with people we disagree with in this era of polarization. How do we engage with people who have entirely different narratives, whether it's around climate change or around vaccine? And I'm wondering, given that you're there at that nexus of policy and opinion formation and perspectives, what, what do you do? What advice do you have in, in this day and age? Should we just not talk politics with people we disagree with? Or what's happening? And, and how do we continue to work and sort of exist with those we disagree strongly with? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, the thing that doesn't work is trying to change people's minds. Wow. So if you enter into a conversation hoping to change someone, you're already operating at a deficit. Hmm. What I try and tell people uh, that's useful is to, to readjust your expectations about what a win is uh, in any kind of policy discussion or policy debate. A win is, in, in, my, in my view, um, helping someone else, helping their idea get better, right? And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's dissonance in action. It, it is very uncomfortable to let somebody else 
somebody else's idea become more prominent than yours. Hmm. Uh, being the bigger person in any kind of discussion should be our aspiration, even if it doesn't feel very good, right? And so if you want to have conversations about politics, in other words, it's, it's, not, it's not agreeable politics, it's mostly the disagreeable stuff, go to the table prepared to let someone else's point have merit. Try and see that merit, try and see the value in, in how they're thinking about it, uh, and, and just let that be the end of it. You don't have to change them. You don't have to win. You don't have to walk away with a victory. It's hard to do, but that's, that is, uh, that's what the research suggests you should do. The other, the other piece um, that's important is that uh, we start thinking about how to design a curriculum. I think, I think we really want to do some of that at Goldman around active learning, active listening, uh, perspective taking, uh, empathy, uh, communication, persuasion, and among other things, just learning how to breathe. These may seem like very soft skills that have no relevance to any vocational area, but they will help you when you start having conversations about what's important to you when somebody else may not see it. And that's, that's whether it's going to see the movie that you don't want to see or whether it's a policy that may actually make your life more difficult. Um, being able to have those skills that allow you to be an active listener and a, 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 a change maker in the truest sense. I hope Rich Lyons is somewhere out there. <laughs> um, uh, I think that is the way we can really understand what's powerful about Berkeley is that here you get exposed mm. to life. I mean, it confronts you head on. You can't walk down any street anywhere around Berkeley and not see life happening. So instead of taking a position on it, embrace it, continue to learn about it and, uh, and, and share it. But don't expect to change people um, uh, because you're, you're up against a molehill. They'll, they'll be thinking the same thing you're thinking and you're not going to change either. So why, why set that as your expectation? Fascinating. Um, let me go to a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first question is somebody has posed is how big is the impact of public policy? And I, my guess is what they're getting at here is, is this just sort of an academic endeavor, the, the whole public policy thing, or are there really, are there real world consequences that you can draw a line from what's happening at graduate schools of public policy to what's going on in the real world? Yeah. I, I'll re return to um, what public policy is. It, it is how the public sector seeks, seeks to solve public problems. So these are not private problems. These are not, hmm. you know, hey, you, you, you stepped on my shoe. I mean, they may, they may arbitrate the problem on the back end. But in terms of policy, we're thinking about how do we take a problem that, that we can exclude everybody from? So if it's smog, for example, and deal with it in a way that doesn't uh, it's not, it's never going to be perfect, but it doesn't necessarily harm one group uh, in just to help another group. That's a hard thing to do. And so public policy is always about finding that middle ground, selecting mm. those alternatives or those choices that have costs and benefits. They, nothing is cost-free, nothing is benefit-free or benefit-perfect. And so the public policy schools give you those skills to balance things out to really understand what should be the criteria. What do we expect the policy to do? How do we define the, the, the problem itself? What are we trying to accomplish and how do we know it's there on the back end? When is it time to do something different or change mm. course? How do we know that the right citizens or non-citizens are benefiting from the policy in the way that we planned? That's what the policy analyst does. Policy is not designed to be a perfect solution. Hmm. It's designed to help solve a problem, not perfectly, but solve a problem and give people options, give the public options. And again, we, we don't seek to try and solve private issues, but the bigger public issues. And for example, who's a citizen? Big public issue. Who should be able to buy housing in certain areas? And if they can't, how do you open that door so that people aren't living in their cars or in campus? If we have a water crisis, how do we communicate the people that we need to kind of tamper down our water usage and, and make it easy for everyone to have access to, to good water, uh, low cost good water or free water in some cases. 
So public policy schools aren't just going through an academic exercise. They're actually looking at public problems and helping uh, people to understand the market's not solving them. Government's going to have to step in. The solution's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be an evolutionary process of, of trying to get closer to what, what really does work. You know, so I'm curious. Um, nearly every public policy issue you raised just now and in previous uh, answers um, nearly every single is issue was politicized. So how do you keep politics out of the classroom or do you? Um, are our professors expected to be blatantly political with in terms of their opinions about what the role of government should be? Are they market oriented? Are you know everything now is tainted with some sort of political color, one or the other? How do you deal with that in, uh, in the school and in the curriculum and in your hiring of faculty? That's a good question. Uh, wow. <laughs> you, you cannot have policy without politics. Uh, politics, in a very basic definition, is uh, any decision about who gets what and how. And if someone's getting something, someone else is going to be judging whether or not they're deserving of what they've got. So this is, this is again, the political psychologist piece. And they'll make a judgment about what should happen if they're undeserving. Uh, just as they make a judgment about what should happen if they are deserved. And then they have reactions to that. So, so politics, you can't disentangle politics from thinking about policy. You can do your best to think about policy analysis as mm -hmm. apolitical. So just as the scientist seeks to have a scientific methodology for understanding a bigger research question or a bigger issue and, and shies away typically from the normative debates, is it good or bad? as opposed to, is it doing what it's supposed to do or not? How do we measure the outcomes and measure the inputs and see if they're aligned the right way? So the policy analyst is primarily, uh, in, in theory, supposed to be focused on the costs and benefits of the policy, the outcomes, the ways in which people experience it, whether the problem is de defined the right way, whether the story is being told in a way that gets the public to support the policy and therefore support the democratic process. Um, and that, that requires a, a lot of skill to try and not bring your politics in there. And we, we do our best to try and say they should be disentangled when you're analyzing the policy. But when you're thinking about it, mm. the politics, you can't help but, but let them come in. Hmm. Um, great answer. I got a lot of food for thought there. Right. Uh, I'm going to turn to a question, another question that came in from the audience um, who asks, how do you distinguish being aware of public opinion about a particular policy from pandering to public fads? And I guess this gets to that whole relationship between opinion and politics. Do you follow it? Do you lead it? And how do you distinguish between the two? Yeah. Years ago, when we decided we need that, the, that people were important in governing, we had to come up with a methodology or a way of getting the people's voice. Direct democracy is messy. So if we've got 300 and we may have 400 million people in the United States, how do we determine, how do we listen to all 4 million voices? Some of them are underage and may not have a, a good way. So what we do is we come up with these rules and say, well, if you're a certain age, we'll listen to you more. Uh, and some will listen to you less. We then have to come up with a way to make sure that voice is representative of everyone and do it in a way that's scientific. So public opinion in the, in the scholarly sense has a scientific method behind it, a method that's, that's not just about uh, polling, but a method of random sampling and statistical estimation based on um, uh, you know, data collection and other, other things. So public opinion is supposed to be information about what the public's will is. And it's always a snapshot in history. It's never predictive of the future, even though many people like to use polls to try and predict who's gonna win an election or how the public will respond to something in the future. That's not what polls and public opinion surveys were designed for. So you, you, you use public opinion information to inform how you think about things. You shouldn't always use it as a reason to decide. It should be a part of the equation for decision making, but it shouldn't be wholly uh, the only criteria for decision making. And that's because, as we know, once people know they're being studied, they change their behavior. Hmm. Once you have opinion and an ad comes out, it changes people's perspectives and they may come up with different opinions the next day. Again, the political psychologist's currency is that we understand 
that that random error happens and that people will change their behavior in systematic ways under different informational conditions. And we have tools that help us take that into consideration. So as we're thinking about the public and how it responds to leaders and policies and factions and commercials and controversies, we're always uh, trying to take partition those things out that are meaningful and those things that are just kind of air and random noise. So I'd like to toss, toss you some softballs, but I'm afraid that's not an option because we have some really good questions coming in. Um, pretty, pretty tough ones. There are no good a, softball questions? Uh, no, this is a okay. good hardball question. Here we go. Uh, from a member of the audience. Incrementalism, where we have an inherited status quo and are only able to make changes on the margins, has been a dominant school of thought in public policy for the last few decades. How do you think public policy will evolve either past this idea of incrementalism or within this idea of incrementalism? I guess my main question is, the person writes, what's the cutting edge of how we think about public policy right now? Yeah, I, I, certainly there was a policy faculty member or scholar somewhere that either looked that up or just is in yeah, the somebody, somebody threw you a fastball under the chin there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I look at the... Uh, the tax code that the Trump administration passed, uh, that didn't seem like incrementalism to me. Hmm. Uh, I sometimes look at War Powers Act uh, and the, the actions that come about, that doesn't seem like incrementalism to me. I think about uh, some elements of voter ID laws and uh, how we think about citizenship and how we look at our border doesn't look like incrementalism to me. So how we think about policy it's kind of a, it's, it kind of, it goes through ebb and flows, I think, or, or it should go through ebb and flows. How we analyze policy has a set of tools that we use to understand it's, whether it's good or bad. How the public adopts and accepts the value of a policy is something we have very limited control of now. Uh, and that's because there's so much free information out there. For every good lecture you get from a faculty member at the university, they'll, on the internet, get a bunch of contradictory stories. And it's then it's up to them to decide what's most important. So I think a good framework for public policy is sticking with the idea of really understanding what the problem is and making sure it's well-defined, thinking about the range of solutions and knowing that no one of them is going to be 100% effective or light, and, and thinking about what's feasible to, to the policy scholar out there. Um, it could be something that's incremental or it could be something that's a radical change and you have an opportunity to adjust. And then you have to defend it on the back end and therefore talk about what the story of the policy is, its value, um, how it will change uh, our democracy of the United States for the better. And just stick on that, that messaging. Uh, you can't get rid of the politics, but policy is about solutions and not wholesale solutions, but just parts. And you have to encourage others, private sector, nonprofit sector, others to kind of get involved and, um, and it's tough now, certainly. Uh, even, even at a university, for example, our policies are quite incremental. Radical change is not supported. So we should be thinking about one or, out of the hundred policy ideas we have, one or two can be a little bit radical and we should move forward with that. So it's about picking which one or two those are and being okay with that. And then slowly migrating the incremental curve a little bit more to the the big change curve and seeing how it sits for a while and then maybe going back to incrementalism. Yeah, I wonder how that, I mean, everything you say makes a huge amount of sense, but I, and I wonder how that lands with your classic or your maybe your stereotypical or even cliched Berkeley graduate student who wants to change the world tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I think it's okay to have diversity. I think it's okay to have diverse perspectives and I would be quite open to someone, uh, you know, I've been out in the world, I've looked, as a graduate student, I wanted to change the world too. Um, it's not as easy as we think. And I think, uh, I think you have to pick and choose your impacts, mm. right? And, and very early on in my, in my professional career and then in the academic career, I couldn't, make, I couldn't make everyone do those things that may be impactful, but I could, have one, I could influence one person and I could help them understand things in a different way. And that was enough for me. So sometimes we want change to be something everybody else sees instead of what we accomplish. And so it, it's important to set realistic expectations around 
uh, what can be done, but that doesn't mean you have to reduce your energy or your passion for seeing change. It's when you go into a situation, understand what's feasible. We teach that in the public policy schools. What's doable? What's, what, what's possible? And, uh, and then kind of find the mean, you know, that have, mm. use your variance, your diversity, and find what the mean is and then go after it. And slowly you'll build a partnership that builds another one and builds another one. You've got a fist. Here's another one. This is almost like a softball. This person asks, how do you plan to strengthen the pipeline at the undergraduate level for undergraduates interested in public policy since this person states uh, or their belief that the pipeline is very weak across the nation? So one, do you buy into the to the sort of inherent, inherent assumption here the pipeline is weak? And if you do, what plans or thoughts do you have about strengthening it? It's an interesting thing. I don't know that I agree that there's a weak pipeline into public policy. And I'm not sure if it was degree programs or the field of public policy in general. They, they, were, talking, they were talking undergraduate here. Under, undergraduate, uh, the pipeline into our undergraduate mind. No, it's like, I guess the pipeline, it seems to be at the undergraduate level. In other words, that where for undergraduates interested in public policy, person asking questions suggests that that pipeline starting at the undergraduate level is weak and difficult. Yeah, I, I don't have enough information to, to confirm or deny that to be true, but I'll, I know that there are several pockets in health policy, in the law school, in high school of business, of course, in the social sciences, and I'm sure the natural sciences as well, uh, there are areas of public policy. They're not, I guess, maybe broad wholesale majors, but they're areas where you can engage public policy because, again, public policy is what governments do to solve public problems, right? So any public problem that you're trying to solve at some point will require policy. And... So the inroad to the field of public policy may be a bit narrow if we're a professional school, uh, you know, and, and so we don't have undergraduate majors. We have an undergraduate minor, so it's available. But if you wanna go into graduate study or go into the work, it's really about having a set of tools to help you to see problems in a certain way and then working with teams, whether it's in the public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, to come up with solutions that are feasible, that are effective, that are efficient, that you can rationalize and, and justify to the public and the like. And, uh, and I think there are a lot of majors that can help the pipeline into public policy work. But in terms of the, the, uh, the undergrad program, I can't speak to. Got it. Um, David, one area, it seems like a major area in, in your professional life, your academic life that we haven't talked about yet is race. Um, the book that you have coming out is called Racial Resentment in the Political Mind. Tell us a little bit about what that book is about and what drove you to write, write it. Yeah, wow. So the book, the book is about thinking about race uh, and how race matters in a way beyond simple racism and prejudice. In that if you look at public attitudes about any particular issue and you use an indicator of racism to try and predict those attitudes, racism and prejudice may explain some of the variants, but it doesn't explain all of it and it doesn't explain a majority of it. And in most cases, it doesn't even explain a third of it. So there are other things that are going on that uh, may bring people to the same position as someone that is racist or prejudiced that we may not be thinking about. And so the book is about exploring just world beliefs. Just world beliefs are beliefs that people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. Yeah, are you, are, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you saying yeah. just world as in- Just a, world, the belief in a just world. The world is just. Uh, so the shortcut of justice is something is just. So belief in a just world is the belief that again, the world doesn't necessarily need the same, the, need to change the things that we experience. They work for us. Yeah, there may be bad actors and bad people out there, but our world is fine. And it doesn't mean that we all agree on that world. It just means my system is fine. So you think about religion, for example. Uh, I believe in what I believe. And if someone tells me that someone uh, you know, is experiencing religion in a negative way, I don't seek to change 
the system, the world as I know it, that person may need to change. And so the way people process information about change is one of resistance. And some of that stems to our, our notion that our current ways of doing things are just, they're the right way of doing things. And if someone is impinging on that right way of doing things, I should react with some level of defensiveness because it's, it's unjust that I have to change to accommodate it. So in the area of race relations, that means if we're thinking about policies that help bring about racial equality, they may involve me having to kind of not get as much benefit out of something as someone else, a racial minority, for example. I don't know that that's fair. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be opposed to it, but I'm not going to be supportive of it either. And so it's very, it's very human for people to resist change. And therefore, if you have inequality and you're seeking to bring about equality, you, you, people can't just stay high in, in the world and people stay low and then there be equality. Some way they have to come down and another group has to come up. That's the only way to get uh, equality. And so the book is about um, how that occurs in people's minds, what's acceptable, what they can tolerate, how they think about issues through justice and not just through racism and prejudice. And it gives us a way to look at the political mind as how we are distributing values and benefits and rewards in society. And, and that's the political mind. And then how we resent when those things are doled out to people who don't deserve them. And then how race colors that resentment. You know, so it makes me wonder to, and want to ask you from an analytical, not necessarily a political point of view, what your take is on a lot of commentators who've talked about the extent to which racial fears are, were a, really behind sort of the, a key factor in, in, Trump's, in President Trump's election. The fear of loss of place um, and of status and of a changing world mm -hmm. and moving towards more diversity. Is that something that rings true for you from your perspective and from your studies? What's your take on all that? Yeah, it sounds like you, you've read at least half the book so far. <laughs> um, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's not something that's so far fetched, right? That if we looked at any other subject except for beyond race, it would just make perfect sense to us that if we had to all of a sudden change how we do things at the University of California, Berkeley, people would see that as kind of a threat to our traditions, our statuses, mm. our, our state of excellence. If we start experimenting with things and we take away, you know, it was pretty tough, take away the SAT or take away the GRE or stop grading or start allowing people to take courses that, that allow them that are flipped and, and don't use the Socratic method. All of those changes create resistance and people start wondering, well, what happens if we do it? What, if hap what happens if we change? And so if you take it back to race, it's the same exact thing. It's not just that people hate or dislike racial minorities. It's that there is a belief that our culture, our traditions will change if we have to give up our current way of life, our current way of merit, our current way of thinking about what's right and what should be privileged or prioritized. So, you know, it, it's not such a far-fetched idea. It's just not, it's rarely thought of as a way to think about racial attitudes is that people think that having to accommodate minorities today is unfair because I've done nothing to harm them. It doesn't, if they're unequal, they should work harder or maybe they should do the things I do, but I'm not willing to change the system to make the world hmm. a better place. That is a collective action problem. That is a political science -y and political behavior problem is how we filter information about the world and then how we feel about uh, uh, things like change and, and new policies and, and uh, equality. I'm wondering if one of the motivations for writing the book was a sense on your part that the salience and urgency of racial issues has never been higher in this country. What really was my motivating factor, it started way back in graduate school actually, was that political science had a particular way, and, and social sciences had a particular way of thinking about and measuring racial prejudice. Hmm. And when I looked at the measure or the indicator, I didn't see much racial prejudice in it. And I didn't see much racism in it. And that got me thinking about what is it? What's behind this? In other words, what is the fear that people have that leads to racism? In other words, if you let somebody who's really different have the same status as you, 
what's the problem? What's behind that? Well, one thing it's, it's, there's got to be some injustice to it, right? There's got to mm. be something that creates resistance and anger about it because, you know, racists get pretty upset about, you know, things like racial equality uh, or racial integration, at least. And then there's got to be a moral component to it. And so resentment is an ideal emotion or an ideal sentiment because it's a reaction to some kind of undeserved outcome. Uh, and so when I talk about just world beliefs, that is kind of the motivating force. But the reaction that people have to someone getting something they don't deserve, whether it's being able to live in my neighborhood, being able to eat at the same table, being able to ride in the same place as me on a bus, being able to be in the same classroom, uh, being able to uh, just quite frankly, look someone in the eye um, and be, be proud. Um, if that happens, the whole slippery slope falls apart. We'll all be in trouble. And so that fear is a moral fear that's grounded in, in, and in my research, it says it's grounded in justice. It can be grounded in racism and prejudice, but that's not all it's grounded in. A lot of it is grounded in justice. So my motivation started with what's beyond racism and prejudice. We don't need one single additional article on racism and prejudice to know that it exists, to know that it has impact, to know that people hold it when they think they don't hold it. What's next? How do we think next about about race in America? Um, wow. And does that leave you your studies and, and your research and everything? Does it leave you optimistic, neutral, pessimistic about the possibility that through public policy and through the sort of awareness you're talking about that we can actually address the structural racism in our country and in our government and our society? It doesn't leave me optimistic. Hmm. but it doesn't leave me pessimistic as well. Hmm. It takes, uh, it will take a tremendous shock to the system for us, uh, or it'll take a lot of time for us to realize the promise of our democracy. It won't happen through uh, just public policy uh, because again, ameliorative policy, helping policy exists. And then all it takes is one administration to, to roll it back. And all it takes is one administration to send a signal that, all these other things the prior administration did to kind of help us just made us worse. And here are some specific examples of it, even though the overwhelming majority of examples uh, showed the complete opposite. So talking about positives and benefits is good, but negative information always weighs more heavily on, on individual minds because they have to prepare for negative. They don't have to prepare much for positive. And preparing for negative puts you in a fight or flight mode and therefore makes you less resistant to new information and change. All right. I'm going to give you a softball. <laughs> what color is the sky? Give me that. <laughs> yeah, it's not that soft. Right. Uh, this, this came in from the audience. It's a good question. Uh, but also put the ball in the tee for you. What do you think makes the Goldman School of Public Policy one of the top schools in the country? Just reading this, as someone who is currently choosing graduate schools to apply to, why should I choose Goldman? And if you can't do well on this question, David, <laughs> I won't grade myself, but I'll I'll say what I think is is the Goldman difference is the commitment of our faculty to making sure that students, in the best way they can, that students have a transformational experience that challenges challenges their thinking on what are right ripe solutions for public problems. Students take those experiences and they build a community of their own. I mean, they really do work together and commit to one another around this idea of altruistic input. This notion that we're gonna be public servants in some way, even if we're not working in the private sector, we're interested in these big problems. We're interested in being a part of teams to try and solve them. And in many ways, they want to be entrepreneurial. They want to come up with their own solutions once they're done with, with graduate school at the Goldman School. And we're, we want to really be the, the place where they get trained to be entrepreneurial, to be active listeners, to think in terms of designs and systems, and to, to encounter problems and have uh, confidence that they're going to address them in a way um, that leads to, to change and impact. And so we, we started Goldman with community. That's what grounds everything we do at Goldman. Hmm. That community leads us to think about the kinds of scholarly work around public impact and resolving issues like inequality and unfairness in society. 
that builds on our, our uh, academic enterprise where we're teaching students about those scholarly learnings. Then we give students an opportunity to put those things into action. Once they put them into action, they gain confidence, they mm-hmm. grow, they get better. Then they see the actual impacts and outcomes of their work. And then they're proud of that experience and then they wanna give back and they then become a part of our extended Goldman community and they wanna help others learn and have an, have an impact. And so Goldman has a a very specific uh, uh, model for training students to be outstanding uh, policy analysts and policy researchers. And we've now just uh, brought on a new master's degree program, a master's of development practice that thinks about these things even outside the boundaries of the U.S., that there are these global challenges uh, in a world that need Uh, thinking that it's not just U.S. domestic thinking. Uh, And and that's not to say that that's all we do, but we now have a broader framework for thinking about how to articulate that into a a degree program and then blending our our host of degrees to give students that transformational experience we think is important. So I hope that's that's enough of a pitch to to get the student to, to think about the Goldman School. If not, we have a lot of fun activities that have food. Oh my, well, <laughs> David, I um, really, this has been a fascinating conversation. I um, want to thank you for your time and welcome you to the campus community. We hope we can have you back here on Campus Conversations at some point. Thanks, Dan. It's been great. Go Bears. Yeah. Go Bears. And thanks to all of you for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of Campus Conversations. Stay safe and be well.